or to be a fleet manager, it's like I, I use the picture that is a little bit like you have a lot of balls, different balls in, in, in the air, right? And your your task is not that it's that every balls are at a certain level. Your your only task is that the balls are not hitting the ground. <music> Hello and welcome everyone to this brand new episode of the Auto Tech Show. My name is Mark Babin and as always, it's great to have all of you watching and listening on this episode. It's a good one with a great interesting twist. Thank you so much for being with me. Now on this episode, I'm speaking with the co-founder and managing director at Motum, Dr. Moritz Veltkin, about enhancing both fleet transparency and fleet control. Now, as a former German professional handball player of all things, Dr. Veltkin knows what it takes to build world-class teams and solutions. And with Motum, this is exactly what he's done alongside his team working to enable perfect fleet management interactions between drivers and workshops, a gap that's existed for a very long time. It's nice to see solutions coming in to close that gap. And they're proudly offering this to their over 35,000 active fleet vehicles, a tremendous uh, accomplishment. And that number is growing by the day, it seems. Moritz, thank you so very much for being with me today. I know you have lots going on. You just said you came out of a webinar. It's fantastic to have you. Lots to get into today, but first and foremost, thank Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thanks, Mark, for for having me. Also for the uh, nice, nice and warm uh, introduction. So really looking forward to discuss with you some of the uh, yeah fleet aspects and how the fleet world is uh, yeah evolving in these days. So really looking forward. Absolutely. And before we get into the topic, I have to ask: you came from yeah. a professional sports background, as did I. What brought you to fleet of all things? Yeah, it's uh, the. the the short answer is face, yeah. probably, right? So it's a lot, lot of different coincidences. Yeah, like you said. So in my my first life, uh, I, I used to say that uh, yeah, I was I was quite active uh, in this in the sport world. Like you said, playing uh, handball on a professional level. So that was actually from I don't know beginning with ten years until uh, yeah end of uh, end of the tw- of my twenties. Uh, every day uh, going into the gym, into into the yeah. uh, sports arena, right? So that was my daily daily routine. But uh, yeah, I also had or started then in my twenties, um, also yeah, preparing a little bit the second life, so the career after the career, right? Uh, yeah. Especially thanks to my mother. So uh, she was complaining a lot, probably uh, a lot of the sport <laughs> guys uh, know that. So be aware of the career after your career and. And so I did, yeah, quite quite easy easy solution for that. I studied business administration, right? So that's uh, actually quite quite an easy way. Uh, you can do it in a parallel way. Uh, and after that, I, uh, I was um, active for four years in a, in a consultancy, uh, developing digital business models for big corporations in the in the dock market. And um, yeah, one of my last consultancy project actually was done in the fleet management uh, market. Uh, and that was also the starting point for for Motum, right? So um, I was there with, with, with my consultant team, uh, even in these days. So it was be, twenty, yeah, beginning of twenty twenty. So uh, okay. a short moment before before Corona. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Natalie and Ala, my two co founders, uh, were uh, already part of my of the consultant uh, consultancy team. And then we decided to say, okay, it's enough with all the PowerPoint stuff, and uh, let's probably start something real. Now I'm. Still doing a lot of PowerPoints, but that is actually the way uh, that got me into fleet management. Yeah, so super interesting. Cried. I love, I love yeah. it. Did do you find that coming over to the business world? Do you find yourself kind of still holding on to that competitive edge? And is that what you feel maybe gives you a bit of advantage with building your team and building solutions? Do you have that sports competitiveness like ingrained in you from such a young age? Yeah, it's it, it's a yeah, certain degree of competitiveness, but what I also or what I, I was used to is to get immediately feedback from the sports world, right? So in each training, I don't know, you throw a ball, it doesn't it doesn't matter if you're playing tennis or basketball, you get a direct mm-hmm. feedback. And in the business world, and then, I like I said, I did my PhD, and especially in the academic world, getting feedback from your, yeah, from the effort you put into something can take a while. And that was a little bit struggling with me. So you're, you're working a lot, but you don't know, is it really good? Because... In the sports world, you have the, the the coach at your side yelling at every moment. Okay, it was not hard enough and not precisely and, and whatsoever. And uh, with the building that the startup, 
and then I'm responsible for our go-to-market emotion, for, especially for sales. There I have it to a certain degree, the same feeling, right? So doing cold calling, it's a little bit the same, right? So you get immediately feedback um, and a lot of rejection, but yeah, that's part of the game. Part of the learning process. That's an interesting yeah. comparison. I like that, the instant feedback, I guess I never thought about it that way, but yeah, you're right. It's especially in this side of the industry where you have to develop something for a number of years or months. You don't get that feedback until you get a proper sort of in-market experience rather than in sport. Yeah. So yeah, great, great, uh, great story. I love it. And it's nice to see you down in this spot. Obviously we're happy where you are now, <laughs> but uh, yeah, totally. Yeah, great to have you here. Um, so kind of transitioning nicely off of that point, I guess, of instant feedback. The first topic I want to address with you is one of the main words that we hear within the fleet industry. And it comes up in most conversations. We're, we're talking about it here to again, uh, again today. So it is obviously still a very relevant word and that's transparency, especially when we're talking about optimizing fleet performance and, and fleet process and, and yep. uh, everything to do with that data. Transparency is uh, a huge word and it's one that we see more and more, as I mentioned. Can you explain what it is about transparency from your perspective that's so crucial to fleet operators, I guess, in all facets of the word? Yeah, so probably a few words about Motom and what we're doing and then it makes clear yeah. to have probably my view of you and on your question so with Motom mm. with our platform we are we are building a solution um for yeah motivational we call it motivational but also delivery fleets functional fleets and we are helping mm -hmm. them with all the stuff regarding damages mechanical but also exterior damages and we are trying to help them to detect the eff uh, defects of a car as soon or as early as possible and then give them the best solution or workflows to uh, repair the car if they want to do it um, and especially this pr uh, process involves a lot of different stakeholders right so you have the drivers you have the fleet managers at different locations probably you have insurance companies you have repair jobs um, yeah whatsoever so um, then you have probably sometimes lawyers um, especially in, in the in the dark market um, and the insurance um, the leasing company. So I can uh, I can continue could uh, continue. Yeah, and list. what we are, yeah, and what we are doing with Motum is actually have a client kind of communication platform. So we are connecting all these different players um, to communicate via one one platform. Of course, with different possibilities of APIs to connect to other other systems. Mm -hmm. But as you can imagine, as uh, if you are adding more and more stakeholders into uh, into a process, it really becomes not transparent at all right and especially in the damage um and repair market you also have a lot of let me phrase it in a diplomatic way uh, different motivations so regarding kickbacks and all that stuff and there are certain parties which have an yeah huge interest that the market is or will be in, tra in transparent uh, right because that's part yeah. of their business model um and that was uh, at least our, our starting point to help help fleet managers to get rid of the intransparency and to help them to take make good good decisions. And what is a little bit different from our uh, approach is that we are not really uh, yeah motivated or it's not, it's not important for us if if uh, if a fleet fleet is using our systems. We are not really looking forward to do as many repairs as possible. So that is not one of our main KPIs, but we want to. Um, enable the fleet manager to, to take a good decision, should I repair or should I not? Because there are a lot of factors which can influence the decision, but I have to be aware of the different factors, right? And in the normal way, if I do it, if I'm doing this process with the Excel and all that other stuff, um, I cannot take good decisions. So that is actually, so it's about transparency, but transparency per se, uh, yeah, it's, it's just a factor, so it's not really helpful. But what comes with the transparency is to make better decisions, right? And that is the good good thing about it. And that is what we are what we are doing, or at least try to do. Yeah, it makes decisions, and I like how you you mentioned that that fraud point of view or that that intransparency. It backs up a lot of decisions as well with with irrefutable data because a lot of those doors are open where perhaps they were closed in the past. Obviously, you work with a variety of different organizations and fleet uh, organizations in different parts of, of yeah. the world and different parts of their industries and their niche. Are there common challenges that you see companies facing when they they lack this transparency, they lack those having those open doors? Is it this external motivation that's keeping those doors shut? Or are there other factors and challenges that you see pop up? 
I would say so if, if I'm talking and like I, like I said in the beginning, I'm also uh, part of our sales sales team and I'm uh, yeah still involved in a lot of sales calls uh, because yeah I, I love it I love to to do it um, so that's that's the, the main point here and I would say the main factor is yeah the rising costs right so that is actually the the, the main issue so, so and then there are different uh and especially if um if you're looking at our um, uh, f- um fleet customer segments normally the uh, the cost for the fleets is yeah the the the, uh, the second or third highest um cost budget uh, within, within a firm right so it doesn't uh, it it really makes sense to uh, think about it how to how to uh, decrease the the costs here and of course then we are starting the 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 conversation with the customer okay you want to decrease cost um we can help you with that probably about the uh, the damage rate or the the, the repair costs or the process costs and whatsoever um, and then we are going a little bit deeper, and then it's again the, about the um, uh, the topic of transparency. That they actually then they are answering, oh yeah, I, I've, I've no idea. So we are, it's quite to, to, have it, to make it quite clear. If we are starting a conversation with one of our customers, and then we are asking them, okay, what is actually the the damage rate? So how many how many damages you have? And they have no answer for that, so, right? So they have no 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 clue. Um, and then they could say, okay, yeah, give me, I don't know, one week or two weeks, and then I, I will find it out. Um, but it's not just, uh, yeah, it's it's not just on, on their side that they don't have a system for that. It it starts quite more, uh, yeah, a little bit earlier in the process, but also um, that they are a little bit disconnected from their from their cars, right? So I have a fleet manager sitting, and we have a lot of fleets with different locations, and you have then probably one main fleet manager in one of them uh, of the um, uh, main locations and then you have driving i don't know tens or hundreds of cars driving around uh, and they mm-hmm. are a little, uh, really disconnected with these with these cars right and we are um try to help them to to or to be a little bit closer to their cars and to know okay mm-hmm. which status actually is my car and that means yeah exterior damages mechanicals whatsoever uh, and we are helping um, our customers with that, with our checklist mm-hmm. and so ever, whatsoever. Um, yeah, and that is actually um, then results in a, in a yeah, better transparency, I would say, um, over the whole fleet. This, this, I mean, it, it seems like a lot of similar conversation I have where companies don't know all of their different points and, and they're unaware. Departments that should be talking in today's age aren't, aren't talking. And it seems like that... Uh, that is a, co- a very common challenge, and, and you addressed it there. Is that reflect a company's unadaptability, their their unwillingness to change, and they're they're just living off of models that have worked for so many years, and now we're in a different era? Is it that that rapid change that's kind of catching a lot of people off guard? Yeah, I I guess it's it's always the case, right? So it's not about the question if there is a if there's the right technology into place to solve this problem, yeah. so the, the, the answer is definitely yes. So there are tons of, of solutions uh, if the fleet manager could, could use. Um, but of course, it's, it's yeah, it's a, it's a lot about uh, to adapting the to technology, but also then to get the, um, the buy-in from the drivers uh, and from all the other parties uh, within, the, uh, within the company. So from our perspective, the fleet manager position is, and that is, Mainly, so we are mainly active in the Dach market, mm-hmm. and in the Dach market, the fleet manager position um, is sometimes it's not recognized by the whole company how much stuff they are doing yeah. actually, right? So it's all the legal stuff uh, they have to take care of, of of anything actually, and they are uh, responsible for for a big big budget. But nevertheless, they have really often they have people there just as an yeah ordinary job, so they have no. Yeah, and then they have to work work their way into the, into the job, and that is sometimes a challenge. And then they the starting to be a fleet manager, and then they they suddenly recognize, oh my god, there's so much to do. And then there are all the different providers and vendors uh, and uh, pushing for for software solutions. Um, and then it's yeah, it's sometimes it's definitely tough for for them to adapt to that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely tough with so many changes. That bridge is really nice into the next topic, which is obviously technology, which we have to discuss. It's, again, super relevant to what we're discussing here uh, and, and how it helps, of course, these fleet managers in these new positions or with the amount of work that they have to do. 
just in general, before we get super deep into any specific type of solutions or type of technologies that you have your eye on or that you like, in general, how have you seen technology evolve in the recent years, in the last five, 10 years, uh, as how they've provided greater visibility, greater control for these fleet managers and for these operators in general? How have you seen that evolution? Yeah, so as, as so we see it, the technology at Motum, we see it as an enabler, right? Mm-hmm. Or it's just one part. So we are really starting uh, coming from the problem. So what is actually the problem we want to solve? And if we find a problem which is worth to, worth to solve, mm-hmm. then we will find a good technical solution for that. So right, mm-hmm. so that is that is actually not, not not the problem from at least from our our perspective, especially in the in the fleet management um, segment. And the the issue here or for the fleets is that there's a, such a big variety. So we are, we are still talking to fleets which are operating on on Excel files, right? And and that is. To a certain degree, it's like you said, it, it's working. So it's working, working for them. But um, and then on the other side, we have fleets which are really modern, which have connected vehicles, which getting uh, direct data in, into different dashboards, and then they can communicate directly with um, different service uh, service providers uh, and so on. And they have probably also their own IT department mm-hmm. to develop APIs and all that stuff. Um, and that makes, on the one hand, the fleet market so interesting, but also challenging because it's a really, at least from, from our perspective, a, a huge variety where the fleets are at the moment, technology wise, right? And then, of course, and then you have it also, it's especially in the dark market, you have all the data security topics coming in. So if you're talking about telematics, dash cams, whatsoever, mm-hmm. uh, especially here in the dark market, uh, yeah, you have immediately issues with the data security office officers. Um, for, of course, for us, for 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 good reason, but yeah, to some degree, it's uh, it's also then an, an issue. An issue, and um, I also talk uh, heard a lot of um, if I'm talking with with fleet managers, which are a little bit older, probably I don't know mid fifties or something like that. They really say quite quite frankly to us, oh "God, I, I've I've yeah five years left, and I will not change anything because why why should I so there's no no upside for me it's I've just the downside, but I will never get the 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 upside and for my for my issue for my initiatives right so um yeah is that something you see more and more it's an interesting point i've I've not heard that very often these people just kind of throwing in the towel and saying. I'm not changing. I'm out in a few years. We are at that time where a lot of people will start to phase out over the next five to 10 years. Is that a, a constant growing challenge then for you? It, it depends on the customer segment. So we have one customer segment that is, like I said, we call the motivational fleets. So mm-hmm. these are the classical management cars or probably uh, sales guys cars. Mm-hmm. And for them, the fleet management is just, yeah, I don't know. Well, the, in this case, uh, these guys are quite quite often uh, of, often there, so we, we we hear that quite on a on a regular regular basis, um, that they don't want to to change anything. Uh, it's totally different, of course, if you're talking about functional fleets or delivery fleets, right? So where the fleet is really an uh, important part of the business model, right? So we have some delivery fleets, and of course, if your fleet is not working and not delivering anything, so you've got really a problem. But if your sales guy is not not able to use, I don't know the uh, the his uh, his uh, BMW, and he has to drive, I don't know, an VW. Okay, it's probably a problem for his ego, but he, he could probably make the, the the sale, right? Yeah, yeah, so, not a business critical. So the really the focus yeah. then, from the technology point of view, you feel is really going to that those business critical and those essential yeah. parts of the fleet. Yeah, sure. Really cool. So I want to get more into the, the the deep end of this tech side. Obviously, you're dealing with a lot of these different people in different sectors, like we spoke about. Are there specific pieces of technology or types of technology or maybe areas of the business that technology is helping that, that you really like right now that you've seen being the biggest bang for its buck? Yeah. It, again, I think that is the... The, the second step, so the first step is really about the problem again, right? And, and yep. uh, to identify that. But, but nevertheless, of course, it's, um, I would say for the fleet uh, segment, um, from our perspective, it's definitely AI, right? So that is definitely uh, interesting in all the different forms. So it's it's helping for to analyze pictures uh, like we are doing with you, for example. Of course, it's a little bit different te- technology, but mm-hmm. um, it makes workflows easier, 
Uh, it's also helpful for analyze data, right? Especially if we are, and that makes also the life easier for the fleet manager because they are not a fleet specialist really often or so, sometimes, and they are not a data specialist either. And if you just have the interface with chat GP, uh, GPT or whatsoever, and you just ask, okay, what is my damage rate? And you get an immediately answer. That's definitely the easy. The question then on the other side for us as a business is, are the fleet manager then willing to pay more for the, is, is there really a business case for that? Right. So we also have this, uh, for example, to give you a quite concrete ex example. So it's an yeah. AI, AI. And the other one, of course, is telematics or the direct data from the cars, right? From the connected cars. Mm -hmm. And um, what, what we are doing, or one use case is, of course, uh, we have the quite easy web app checklist. So you can um, do some checklists with our solution. And then, yeah, you get all the, uh, the necessary uh, data to the fleet manager and you have a good overview about the car. Uh, and that is quite quite easy. It's not not rocket science at all. You could, of course, also do that with the connected car data. So, uh, right. So you get, for example, um, the level of the of the uh, gas tank or any service lights and whatsoever. But we ask the fleet manager if they are willing to pay more for that. So if we are adding some of the uh, of these um, uh, connected data, um, for example, regarding the service lights, mm -hmm. if they are willing to pay, I don't know, six to seven uh, euro per month more, instead that their uh, driver is just doing the check via the web app, right? So there's a service light, it's it's red, I just put it into the web app. Yeah. Um, and that is then a little bit the, the second question. So there's the technology really helping, but is it really then worth the, the effort. So from our perspective, it would be great to automate it at all, right? So no question yeah, about it. But also from our experience, the fleet managers are really cost sensitive. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is not so not so easy, easy sometimes. But I would say, coming back to your, your question, so of course, it's, it's AI and it's, it's telematics. Um, so to get the, the data from directly from, from the cars, and that is really helping to yeah speed up workflows and processes and makes all the different um, workflows much 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 easier and more comfortable. Yeah, yeah I think it's really interesting because on paper, like you said, I think a lot of these having these different points connected and these different data points sort of all brought together. From a fleet manager perspective, it makes sense that they would want to have as much of this information as possible so they can prevent costs and prevent all these massive, uh, yeah. Just, just maintenance issues and potential downtimes for vehicles, and keeping other vehicles uh, as 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 um, occupied as possible, and keeping their people efficient. On paper, that makes sense. But it's interesting you're saying they they're really bringing cost into the equation, and they're really sort of comparing. Yes, I would love this, but is it essential to function right now? That, that's kind of the conversation you're having. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and then the conversation is, and. Really often the, the fleet manager is on, on our side and then say, oh, yeah, it's nice. It's a nice solution. It's, it's helping, helping to improve my life or the life of my team. Mm -hmm. And then we are going to the probably decision maker and uh, pitching our business case. And then the, the answer is sometimes, yeah, but I've got you people for that, for exactly for this, what the software is probably really doing. And of course you can, you can uh, pitch it in a different way. And then you have more time for strategic stuff mm -hmm. and whatsoever. Yes, sure. But especially in, in, the, in these times, it's, uh, you really have to come up with a clear ROI, right? So that is uh, really important. That's also development we see. I don't know, probably two years ago, it was more, oh, it's a nice web app. It's a nice workflow. And that was enough as, in, yeah. as an argument for a sale. But now you really have to come up with a business case and a clear ROI calculation. Uh, and that is sometimes not, not so easy just based on software, right? But uh, yeah, really interesting. Is, so, yeah. Uh, do you do you feel like that that ROI is an interesting topic? Because the conversation I've had, it, it's literally been where it said uh, the ROI is there, and if if a fleet operator is not seeing it, then they're not looking in the right place. From your perspective, and obviously this is how you're trying to work these conversations. Obviously, when you get this resistance, from your perspective, do you feel like when we talk about these different data points connected and optimizing these processes from your perspective do you feel like the roi is there it's just how that's communicated the, the roi is definitely there uh, it depends a little bit so what is the challenge is really if you're starting with a new process or a new software is to have the uh, the starting point so uh, if, I, if i if i start with a new fleet for example and i want to have an roi and i, I want to see the improvement 
I, I have to know what is the starting point. So for, what are my costs today, right? So what is my effort really today? And if I have no, but I have no transparency at the moment. So I don't know actually what is really the improvement. Mm -hmm. I just see the costs then probably, I don't know, one or two years down the road, but I don't know where I started actually, because it's some a little bit like, like a black box, right? But, and we, that is what we are really doing, uh, try to uh, do in the sales process or it's also in the onboarding process to see, okay, that, that will be based on our experience from all the fleets we are working with. And we are doing the onboarding uh, calls with, with our customers. And we say that is the impact we see normally uh, at, at, the, at the client or customer side. So we have then an average case, a best case, and a conservative case. And there's a range, and probably in this, within this range, there will be uh, some of the results. And then we really try to track within half a year, year, one, uh, one and a half, and then two, two years, um, the improvements. Um, but yeah, you, ha you have to do, do that because otherwise, um, so our contracts are uh, normally two years, Mm -hmm. uh, and after two years, you have to prove that you're uh, improving the the, the, the the fleet costs or the fleet processes, because otherwise, um, yeah, you're probably out of out, out of the race. I like that topic about expectations because I think it's 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 a a good one to address because this isn't an overnight fix. You can't plug something yeah. in and then immediately see businesses up 200%. What should those expectations be? Especially when we look at this transparency, I think identifying that there are transparency gaps is, is a, is a first step. And I think that's a really important first step, but what are the realistic expectations that operators should expect when they, they get into situations like this, where they're looking at new types of solutions? Of course, of course, it depends a little bit which part of the fleet management you, you're addressing, right? So we are really working, like I said, with the damage management and all the issues all around the cars. And what we see probably in, in, in our numbers is, and that is, we, it's not like I said, it's it's not not easy uh, easy easy to measure, but we see definitely, and then and that's also the problem. Then you have sometimes anecdotal stories so we have for example one one delivery um uh, cu customer uh, and they are delivering fruit and also fresh fish for example right within, okay. within the city uh, and they are using our uh, our checklist to um to check the like i said the um, level of gas and mm -hmm. if there's a certain uh, under a certain level then the driver is not allowed to drive because in the in the in the past they really had a lot of cases where the driver was suddenly within the city and without gas and then wow. it was just sta standing around and the whole uh yeah whole food uh, in the back was yeah uh, and and so and and that and we improved that but it's really difficult to to measure it right so i have some stories like that to, to tell but if you're just then telling that to the ceo of the company he said yeah nice but okay is it repeatable? Is it measurable? Right. It's the same question I would ask to my to my guys. Um, but but nevertheless, we see that what we definitely see is so a certain improvement regarding the the, the process. Um, if you really um, have a digital process of reporting and then um, reporting issues and damages and then sending it to to workshops, that it's up to really realistic twenty to thirty percent of the process time. You could definitely improve because you are. Um, you don't need any yeah questions back. You have a better quality of data. You have pictures, all that stuff. So it's actually quite quite easy uh, improvements to to get to the results. Yeah. So that's that's yeah. It. That makes a lot of sense. So I guess kind of just as a final note, and kind of wanting to yeah. bring this full circle for companies, you know, listening operators that are going, yeah, maybe I I do have some transparency gaps. I don't know the answer to those questions. From your perspective, where do they start? Where do they start looking? What do they start asking themselves? Where should they start if they if they do realize that they do have some gaps and they don't know some answers? Yeah, I would. I would really do an, an analysis. So, where what is really an issue for 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 myself, right? And to really to prior, prioritize it because I don't. So, to have this kind of uh, fleet or to be a fleet manager, it's like I, I use the picture that is a little bit like you have a lot of balls, different balls in, in, in the air, right? And your your task is not that it's that every balls are at a certain level. Your your only task is that the balls are not hitting the ground. And even if, if one ball is 
falling. And, and then in the last minute, you just uh, yeah put, put it up again. So that is a little bit like a, like I see a, a fleet management, and especially with all the delivery delivery fleets. So really be sure what is critical to your to your business, right? And then um, to see um, which are there solutions in, in, in the market, right? Um, and to see okay what is really uh, re- really helping uh, helping myself and um, what I really like to to or what would we provide to our customers is to, to test it right and that is not so common and probably that also a, a problem of, of the DAH, software DAH market is they are really often and I'm, um, they are buying software even with a with a two or three years contract without testing at all. Right and myself as a, as a private person, I would never buy a, a software without testing it. I don't know how it is with you, but um, that is yeah, just but that is probably I guess also uh, really special for 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 the dark market. So it's about prioritization, um, and then to see okay, what is what kind of budget I have, and also the capabilities because mm-hmm. what I also see and that is. That a lot of um, the, the fleet managers they are looking for different, or the, in the end they have different software solutions into place. So one solution for I don't know for the administration staff, one for operational. Um, then they have a, a certain a, some for the ESG com, um, tracking or whatsoever. So for, for di- different solutions, um, and then it's really difficult to plug them all together. Of course, all the vendors claiming oh we have apis and it's so easy to connect each other and to transfer data but but i need the capabilities for that right um and that is really often than 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 missing and missing there so um but that is because you also in the beginning you asked for for some development so i see that a fleet manager is to really have a competence in in, in buying and using and implementing software uh that is really um, really important and getting e- uh, even more important, important. So I don't think that you can, it, it's even more important than have knowledge about cars. Probably in the past, it was more really that the fleet managers uh, are also some to a certain degree car guys, right? Mm-hmm. But I guess what is, especially for, for bigger fleets, you definitely need a big or a really high competence in, uh, in buying and implementing software and dealing yeah, with software providers. Really yeah. Dealing with the right partners and and having kind of trust in those partners you're working with. And then, as you said, kind of identify where you are on that timeline so that you know where to jump in. I think that's also a really important point and uh, something I think, yeah, I can certainly reflect on and I know those listening will will as well. But uh, yeah, fantastic point to end on. I think there's tons of insights. Again, my notepad is full. I get so much great information from these talks. So I really, really appreciate the time. Yeah, Yeah, and I think the audience will as well. I think there's lots of good takeaways here that... uh, they can start to think on and, and reflect on a little bit where those gaps are and where they are in that journey um, and what's important to them. I think that's really important what you said as well is what's what are those business critical tasks, especially in this climate and in this economy, and how can those tasks and those gaps be shortened and, and eliminated perhaps. So I think yeah. Yeah. people like you, the, you know, people in, that are bringing these types of solutions in this consultancy and this partnership approach uh, is definitely the right, right way forward. And I think you guys are doing great work at that. And it's great learning from you here today. So I really, really appreciate the time uh, and the talk before we close on the episode, any final notes that uh, you want to uh, address or bring up? Uh, no, I guess there was a, was a good talk and just, um, yeah, probably ended a, a little bit. So what, what we learned, and I guess it's also true for, for a fleet manager, um, oh. Is you have you have to focus to a certain degree. So you you cannot do any anything um, with a with a certain budget. And like you said, in, in certain times where you have also budget restrictions, uh, yeah. you really have to focus. What are probably more quick wins? What are which which uh, initiatives will take a little bit longer? Um, and yeah, so from from our perspective, the fleet market uh, is really um, quite. Quite, quite active and developing uh, the development is really really nice to see and uh, we are yeah proud to be in this market so and like you said like you said in the beginning um, I don't know I had no clue about the fleet market I don't know six or seven years ago yeah. uh, and now uh, we are here and I'm loving it so yeah yeah thanks definitely for having me. 
It is. It's a very dynamic time in the industry with all the new tech coming to market, all the challenges yeah. with the economy, with with individual operations, with with um, different laws coming into effect. It's a very very dynamic time, and I think it's an exciting time to be involved in it from the software solution side, from the fleet operator side, it is a really exciting time, especially if you have a passion for it. And I think clearly you've shown that. And I know those listening have it as well. So listen, I really appreciate the talk. Thank you again so very much Mark, for today. And uh, yeah, wishing you guys a great summer and a great second half of the year. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. And thank you everyone for listening and watching this episode of the Auto Tech Show. It's been great having you and great having you listen to this show. I certainly enjoyed it. Hopefully lots of takeaways and reflections that you can move forward with in your operations, help identify where you are in that journey, where those gaps exist, what are the critical things for you, especially when we talk about transparency and technology. Those two elements coming together can really bring a lot of quick wins and a lot of change to your organization that, uh, yeah, could, could help your bottom line at the end of the day. So uh, lots to reflect on. Hopefully you've enjoyed that. Again, a big thank you to Motum for this talk today, to uh, our guest, Moritz. Again, uh, great having him on the show as well. So with that, we'll bring this episode to a close. If you have any questions or comments, just leave them down below. We'll address them. You never know where they're going to end up. With that, that's the end. Thank you guys all so much for listening. We'll see you on the next episode of the Auto Tech Show very soon. Bye for now.